So this effect is called the superstar effect. And it occurs when one individual can reach many people. And that, that one individual is much better than everybody else is sort of really crucial for this. <coughs> and many markets adjust by having superstars doing better and better rather than by having more and more people enter the industry and reduce the profits of the people who are dominant. Um, and that means that long-term adjustment can actually increase rents. Um, now, a basic assumption of the free entry idea is that talent is durable. That is, that in the long, it may be that you have an advantage in the short term, but then in the long run, someone can learn to do the same thing that you do, and therefore that will drive your profits to zero. Um, and the idea here is that there's some fixed cost to becoming talented or some fixed cost to adopting the technology, um, and that once you've done that, it's cheap to imitate. In some cases, this is definitely plausible, like the reverse engineering of the iPod that we talked about earlier, or studying for a profession that's in high demand, navigating the initial regulatory barriers to enter an industry. But in some other cases, it's very unlikely. So becoming a great athlete doesn't just require that you spend a lot of years becoming a great athlete. It's not like, you know, someone's a great athlete, after enough years, some, lots of people are going to be just like him. It requires being born with uh, certain physical talents, right? Um, one thing that's very hard to learn is the ability to, like, be an innovator, right? You can learn a particular skill, but learning how to innovate is not very easy and requires a whole range of skills that can't necessarily be learned. Some of them have to be born, or we don't even know how they're created. They just sort of show up. Um, in the internet age, most of the things that require some time to, you know, learn or whatever can be learned really, really quickly. It's the things that can't be learned that are really scarce, right? So it's very easy to set up a company these days. You just, you know, buy a website and whatever, but what's really hard is to become the sort of person who has the ability to generate the ideas that are, uh, that are worth starting companies based on. So often, it's not really time that's the most important element. And in fact, there's even some cases when time might work against entry into an industry. So, um, the assumption here was that talent was durable, the question was how durable it was, but, you know, in some cases, talent could even be uh, storable. And Victor, Victor Liu, uh, can you think of some cases where talent or desire to start a company might be storable rather than durable? Well, like, in the, as you mentioned in the examples previously, like, with, like, an athlete who, like, waited too long to, like, like, if you, like, waited past his time or something, to, like, enter the market, would well, but being an athlete at one period wouldn't necessarily make it harder for him to be an athlete later, right? And that's the definition of historical. So, okay, uh, I don't want to cheap out looking at the slide. What do you think, Mike? <laughs> I don't know. Could one way be like if you have an idea, it's like just one good idea, but then you don't execute it until later on? Or, or you have one good idea. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a possibility. The thing I was thinking about was, like, charitable giving for disaster-struck regions. So, like, what, what often happens is that, like, you know, when um, Haiti has a disaster, everyone gives them money, right? But then people get bored of Haiti. So if Haiti is constantly having disasters, nobody gives them money, right? Whereas, um, you know, it's not like they have to develop the ability to give money to Haiti. It's like they get bored of giving money to Haiti. So, in fact, what you often see is that when there's, like, a disaster, everybody rushes in to give money for a particular country. But if a country is, like, in chronic poverty, and, like, everyone there is worse than, like, everyone in Louisiana, you know, during Hurricane Katrina, nobody cares. Because they're like, oh, those people are always in the crapper. We don't, we don't care about them, right? So, um... The, the more misery there is, like, the more you get a sense of that it's just inevitable, and that's just a lot of the people in that place. So in that sense, you know, entry into the charitable industry may well be storable uh, rather than durable. Um, yeah, Edward. Um, so, like, what if you're, like, I mean, on the topic of, like, storable, yeah. like, what if you go into an industry that, like, burns you out, you know, like... Yeah, so that was the next thing I was going to say. So, um... I mean, I was looking at the slide, but, like... Yeah. I mean, like, is... 
It seemed like you're, when you we mentioned that the examples like yeah. finance and peace, yeah. it just seems like a, a bubble, like a like, 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 <coughs> man point. Yeah, Doesn't well, like really, I'm sorry, go I on. mean, you don't think those things burn people out? Um, I mean, I. I mean, like for the Peace Corps, like I know, like a lot more people joined the Peace Corps because, like, Jack, John Kennedy, you know, yeah, made that speech and everything. It was a like, popular, yeah. Time. And then, like, maybe for the finance industry, not to say that it's not as like in demand now that, it, I'm, you know, it, it's probably like, a bigger deal in the past before, yeah. like, you know, the first of the crisis of 2008. I mean, I think that most people would not want to go into the finance industry or into the Peace Corps for more than a couple of years in their life, right? Uh, not everybody, but a lot of people in finance drop out. And almost everybody who goes into the Peace Corps doesn't stick with that or any form of government service for long afterwards. So really, there's only once in a generation when you can like get a bunch of people going into the Peace Corps or get a bunch of people going into finance. <coughs> and so those things tend to be storable rather than durable. Like There's, a, there's only one chance to get, get in, basically. Um, or living abroad or starting a company abroad is another example. Most people only want to do that once in their life, right? And so if there's a big stimulus to do that, that'll mean people won't do it later. Um, so um, a long-term growth of China might actually cost less migration of people to China uh, or young people to China than a short life thing where people want to make a quick buck there because people don't really want to move to China for their whole life. They just want to, like, at some point, uh, you know, spend a couple of years there. So I think what this all means is that the distribution of talent is, like, absolutely crucial. Um, because this is going to determine the rents um, and the nature of the long-term responses and so forth. Um, but, of course, it's not the whole distribution of talent that matters. Because only the people who are the best at something are going to choose to go into that area. And um, if um, some people are very good and others are bad, but all the very good people are all exactly the same, that's going to be exactly the same as a free entry model. So the real thing is, among the best people, are there some that are like much, much better than even the good ones? Or is it that all the really good people are the same? So that's really the key question. And a simple way to formalize this is the hazard rate. Um, Matthew Green? Yeah. What, what is the hazard rate and, and how does it relate to this? Okay. So the, the hazard rate is if we have a distribution with cumulative distribution function f, and with a PDF, uh, little f, the hazard rate is lambda of x, which is little f over 1 minus uh, capital F. Right? And so what this is, is it says um, how many people are right here compared to how many people are above you. If this is going up as you go up the distribution, then that means that like, as you get to hire uh, people in the distribution who are better, that there's even more people above them than there are people there. So that means that there's like, a lot of inequality at the top of the distribution. That among the best people, they're really different from one another. Right? This is a very um, standard measure of this. Uh, sorry, that's if it goes down. That's if it goes down. If it goes up, that means that there's a lot of people on the margin compared to how many people are above them. So if this is going up, then the tails of the distribution are going to be thin. There's not going to be very many people at the very, very top. If it's going down, then it's, the tails are going to be uh, thick. So the, st the standard distributions with thin tails are anything that has an upper bound, where there's just nobody above a certain level. Those are things with very thin tails. A normal distribution and most standard statistical distributions also have thin tails. Um, but when this thing is decreasing, there's fat tails. And Clementina, what's an example of a fat tail distribution? So like 
I mean, I mean, uh, just a statistical distribution. Okay. Uh, so some some statistical distributions uh, with bat tails are the Pareto distribution, the log normal distribution, and some of the extreme value distributions. So let me show you those. So a uniform distribution looks like this. It's big in the middle, and then it drops off to zero, right? A normal distribution is, you know, peaked in the middle, and then it drops off to zero pretty quickly outside that. But a log normal distribution, which is this yellow one here, you see it just keeps on going. There's quite a bit, no matter how far you get out, right? And another way to quantify that is to take the inverse of that hazard rate. So if it has fat tails, then it should be getting big. Um, oh, sorry. It, this, this is the hazard rate. So you see that as we get larger, this gets very, very big. For the uniform, it just like skyrockets, right? For the normal, it goes up really, really quickly. But for the log normal, it goes down, and it, and it goes lower and lower and lower, right? So what that's saying is for the log normal distribution, no matter how high up the distribution you are, there's always a lot of people who are better than you. You know, this is a, this is a standard um, thing that people sort of uh, talk about anecdotally is that um, you know as you learn more uh, you sort of realize and as you get better at something you realize how much better than you the best people are and if you live in a world that's like that where the better you get the more inferior you feel uh, you're probably living in a world of fat tails if you, if you are in a place where as you get better, you say, well, basically I've mastered this, you're living in a world of thin tails. And I think we all know from our life there's certain things where there's only so good you can get, and you sort of feel like you're on top of it. And there's other things where, like, no matter how good you get, you feel that, you know, now, like, compared to the people you're comparing yourself to now, you're getting even worse. And that's basically what the hazard rate is about. So the hazard rate measures, as you get better, do you feel like the people who are above you are even better than, than you are. Okay, so um, unfortunately, uh, for people who want to um, make actual progress in their lives, uh, we, we, the data we have indicates that the distribution of talent is extremely fat-tailed at, uh, at its top. Um, in particular, it follows what we call a power law or Pareto distribution. Um, and this is actually so fat-tailed that I couldn't even include it in this graph because it basically is like, <coughs> goes so skyrocketing down that it, that it basically would drop out all the other things. So, um, uh, the distribution follows the following law. And the nice thing about this is it's extremely common empirically, but it's super easy to work with mathematically. So the distribution function is 1 minus x over the minimum level of x to the uh, negative alpha. And this is going to be used tons throughout the course. So, so pay a lot of attention. So um, there, this distribution has some minimum value. No one is below that minimum value. So it sort of represents only the top part of the distribution, where you like start getting very talented people, and then it dies off exponentially. I mean, uh, with coefficient alpha. Um, uh, when uh, alpha is um, not above two, the variance of this distribution doesn't exist. And when it's not above 1, the mean of the distribution doesn't exist. And the reason I couldn't put it on the graph is I couldn't match it up with the mean and the variance of those other distributions, because there's no way to do that. Yeah? Can you define the variables? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. X is the, like, talent. How is it? Uh, I mean, it, it can be lots of different things in different settings. So it might be the, the wage that you earn. You'll, you'll see a bunch of examples in a minute. So it's just some variable that is related to talent or ability or something like that. 